Alrighty. So next up we have GOIDs and Glam Smithsonian em Smithsonian embraces different PIDs for different entities. And we have uh, Best Missile, Suzanne Pilsk, and Rebecca Snyder here to present. So I need someone, there we go. Too many videos still. Okay, let me get rid of, sorry, Quinn, bye-bye. All right. <laughs> I'm off stage. All right. I'm thinking that things are showing up. All right. Yeah, Okay, I just want to say I've been to a couple of Pitapaloozas, and one of the things I really miss is being able to feed off of other people's presentations. So um, these are sort of isolated, and I think uh, there might be overlap and an opportunity to um, share and collaborate more um, as we go on. But first of all, um, we would like to thank, um, to, to gratefully acknowledge the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands the Smithsonian Institution now resides, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home there today. And before we begin the direct discussion on PIDs at Smithsonian, I'd like to make sure you have a context around who the Smithsonian is and what Smithsonian is. As the largest complex um, art and museum complex in the world, we have a lot of things, a whole lot of stuff. And the stuff ranges in topics and size and quantity, and we have been called our nation's attic. But we have and are so much more than old, musty remembrances of things past. We're kind of a magical place, or at least we think so. So we're made up of museums, galleries, archives, research centers, labs, observatories, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and the list, I mean, this just names a few of the things that we are, um, and they each could stand on their own, but they are part of the Smithsonian. And so this isn't even conclusive because it just is a boring list of things and I got bored listing them. So anyway. Um, we think of ourselves as a microcosm of the glam world, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. And we used to have over 23 million public visitors. Thanks a lot, COVID. But also, we are a mix of academic and research. We actually loan things out that other people can then do research on and use for their research, our, our specimens for their research. We have over 6,000 employees. We include um, 1,400 active researchers and over 640 facilities owned and leased. I hope this gives you a sense of why we need to track and to identify our complex situation and the situations we find ourselves dealing with. We recently were spurred on to adopt consistent identifiers across SI, Smithsonian Institution, by the launch of our ambitious open access policy one year ago. 12 million metadata records, about 3 million images, about 3,000 3D models were all released as CC0 in addition to our already released library materials. Here we have an example of a picture of a home of the Cooper Hewitt Museum and a heart pendant from that collection. We have from the Museum of American, African American History and Culture, the late great Hank Aaron baseball jersey and a botany sample specimen of straw. I don't want you to think Smithsonian was not using identifiers before, but let's be honest, as a microcosm reflecting the larger world, nobody agreed. We didn't agree uh, between our units, divisions, departments. It was um, everyone had their own special needs. Just speaking from the library's perspective, we need to make sure that we keep identifiers that work in the virtual name authority file, VIF, and the large world um, catalog OCLC. I'm hoping you all are getting our theme for tonight. Um, these are all images from our collection. Um, the one before, the slide before, had the Tin Man and a, lot, and a, a Lion from the American Art Museum and the scarecrow costume and the ruby slippers that are in our American History Museum. In centralizing all things using like identifiers, we're attempting to create our Smithsonian PID Oz. It might not be emerald, but it is a way for us to be one Smithsonian. One Smithsonian with appropriate identifiers that are appropriate to the materials and needs. A cross-institutional group 
formed to come up with a consensus on the type of identifiers. Yeah, it was, it's a growing continuous thing, by the way. Um, the duties were divided up with the libraries taking on the centralized registration of people, text materials, and objects. And Smithsonian's central computing took on the uh, registration of identifiers for data sets and facilities. We are now using the same identifiers. We have DOIs for text materials and data sets, ORCID for people who are working at SI, and ARCs for collection items and specimens. At Smithsonian, we call them GUIDs, Global Unique Identifiers, but they are, but since we're at Pitapalooza, we're going to try really hard to keep saying PIDs. Um, and I hope that you will follow along on our golden path that is paved with gold specimens from our mineral collection um, as we are off to see the resolver, the wonderful resolver of PIDs. Because, 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 because because of the wonderful stuff we have, woohoo. All right, um, let's begin with why we are using PIDs. So over to Bess. So hi, everybody. Um, I'm gonna start with DOIs. The Smithsonian chose the DOIs um, for digital books, journal articles, theses, and data sets because the schemas that are used with DOIs accommodate robust metadata. And the better the metadata, the more links can be made between resources. The Smithsonian uses two registration agencies for our DOIs, Datasite and Crossref. We use two different registration agencies because each has a different schema and each schema fits a different data type best. Data site schema is designed for data sets and Crossref schema is designed for published works. Next. So of course we've had challenges. Um, the size of the Smithsonian Institution, as you've probably been picking up from Suzanne's presentation, has been a challenge um, when implement implementing DOIs. Uh, DOIs at the Smithsonian are registered by multiple units. Our central IT department supports a FigShare installation which supports data sets and registers DOIs with DataCite. The Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory registers DOIs with DataCite for their Chandra X-ray Observatory. And the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives register DOIs with Crossref for published works. The Smithsonian Libraries and Archives manages the Smithsonian's Crossref and data site accounts and keeps track of the units who are registering DOIs. Also, as a partner of the Biodiversity Heritage Library, we manage their DOIs. Other challenges include how to maintain our DOIs when records are merged, deleted, or taken down, usually due to copyright restrictions, and how to manage versioning of DOIs. Next. We also use ORCIDs. Um, ORCIDs provide a persistent digital identifier linked to a profile owned and controlled by the researcher. SI encourages all staff and researchers to register with ORCID and indicate the Smithsonian Institution as a trusted organization. This allows us to push their publications from our digital repository to their ORCID profile without any data entry by the researcher. It also links the ORCID profile to our Smithsonian profile system. And you should see a poll now um, down at the bottom. And we wanted to know what identifiers are people using for um, people. <laughs> so what identifiers are you all using for people? Uh, next. So we've had challenges with ORCIDs too. One, of course, is the spelling. Uh, but seriously, uh, it is a struggle to get our staff to and researchers to sign up for an account and choose the Smithsonian as a trusted organization. Also, we need a unique identifier for deceased authors and ORCIDs do not allow that. And next, Rebecca is going to talk about ARCs at the Smithsonian. So the Smithsonian selected ARCs for specimen and object records and their associated media, media for a variety of reasons. Um, but honestly, one of the biggest is that our Natural History Museum had already implemented them several years ago because they're common within uh, the natural history realm. Um, but the reasons that uh, natural history picked ARCs remain true for the rest of the Smithsonian. 
Um, one of the biggest is scale. The Smithsonian has a lot of stuff and images and 3D models of our stuff. And in order to keep track of it all and do things with it, um, all these things need persistent identifiers. And so given our numbers, we needed a PID that could accommodate our scale. We went with ARCS with a UUID V4 tail, given our, the incredibly low probability of collisions or duplication. And if you're interested in the nerdly math of that, we can go during that the Q&A. Um, one of the things we were also interested in was it was inexpensive. When your needs are in the many tens of millions, those costs can really add up. Um, and something that we've been talking about in the previous conversation as well is the flexible hierarchies. Um, as we mentioned earlier in our talk that the Smithsonian is quite complicated. Each of our 19 museums, our zoo and other collecting units all have their own system of record and their own primary online sources that the ARC has to then resolve to. So to accommodate this, each of our museums and the zoo and the units and the gardens, <laughs> they were all assigned one data set ID or shoulder for their collection records and another one for their associated media. And just to note, um, the Smithsonian has registered our naming authority or NAN, um, as well as each of the data set IDs or shoulders, but we definitely do not individually register each UUID based ARC. Nobody wants to do that at our scale, let alone easy ID. Um, sorry, cat. Um, and easy, the last thing is that they're easy to keep updated. The um, easy ID admin interface makes it relatively easy for us to make updates and do any reorganization that we need to do, which since we're a quasi federal agency, it, it happens here and there. Uh, boop. I'm old, I, I'm used to film strips. Um, <laughs> so um, that said, there are some rusty spots in our ARC oil can to keep in mind. Um, one of them is that by choosing UUID V4s, it makes each arc extremely long. It's about an average of over 60 characters for each one. Another thing is that they're not human readable. And trust me, we understand that they're not meant to be human readable and only machine readable, which is completely what our preference is. However, we noticed that during the adoption phase across the Smithsonian, it made understanding what they are and accepting them was much more difficult especially for the domains that don't commonly use PIDs. Um, <coughs> also, it would be true for any identifier that we picked, but there's always overlap with other identifiers across domains. So there's often more than one PID per record concept. We store them all, um, but we flag the Smithsonian generated one as the preferred when we do our exports to aggregators or data sharing. Um, the other thing is that each one of our many, many, many collection management systems, including our centralized dams and data services, they all had to be modified to auto-generate and accept ARCs. Um, and as a note to, to anyone who's thinking about doing the same, um, first, I would say that when you're modifying your system, make sure that the um, parent company of your system of record is checking to make sure that there is not an existing ARC before they generate a new one. You'd be really surprised how often this has come up during our development process. Um, also, even though there is an incredibly low list risk of collision, it's always helpful to run a unique value check um, each time you do generate a new one. And I call them paranoia checks, and I've never been disappointed that I did them. I'm always very happy that I do them. Um, and finally, the Smithsonian chose to store the full resolving value of the easy ID. Um, which was a choice that was preferred by the archivists and digital preservation folk, and it was less preferred by the programmers. Um, and we can talk more about that during the Q&A if you're interested in why we did that. And lastly, um, not all publications include ARCs. Um, we certainly encourage all publications that are based on our collections to include the ARC, but not all disciplines are accustomed to PIDs. Perhaps maybe they're used to a DNI, they saw it once, um, and this can cause issues. Either the author doesn't think to submit them or the publication itself doesn't include them and we'll need to work with those publishers to make that happen. So now that we have all these identifiers in place, what does this actually enable us to do? Um, within the biodiversity informatics community, which is where I'm coming from, not the libraries, 
Um, there's this concept called the extended specimen or digital specimen, depending on what part of the world you're from. Um, and there's a diagram on the left, which illustrates the idea of expanding out from a core concept or a core object into larger and larger linked realms. Um, this happens to be a bio example, but the larger concept can be expanded to any discipline. And on the right, the diagram is a similar idea using um, orchids at the center. So essentially, we want to connect information that enhances our knowledge and expands our understanding. And just as a practical example, boop. <laughs> this is a lot of complicated one. OK, so this is an example from our mineral sciences department. And given our presentation theme, you'll never guess what type of ore this is. Uh, <coughs> tin. Um, so this is the collection record. And boop, it happens to have a uh, arc assigned to it. It also has boop, it also has an image that has its own um, identifier. Boop. And then we have a sample that's been taken and it's assigned an IGSN by the researcher, but it was also given an arc by the Smithsonian. Um, boop. So there were multiple articles written about this specimen. Um, and those have been linked to their authors through ORCIDs and um, boop, also a Wikidata uh, Q value, which was a total bonus, but it's not part of the initial implementation of the Smithsonian. And then these articles link back to either the original collection record or also, also the um, image or and or the sample. So the plan is to build on this infrastructure that we have and associate even more types of information, both from within the Smithsonian, like our archives and library records, but also um, global information systems. So that's it. So um, first of all, this is an image of Oni, a dog that is famous in the postal community and is in our postal uh, National Postal Museum. And I thought he would represent Toto pretty well. Um, by using these various identifiers, it allows Smithsonian to connect within itself, and it also connects with the global community. With PIDs, we can use external repositories, participate in developing projects such as the ones that um, Rebecca was just mentioning about the extended specimen and digital specimen concepts. We can leverage, <clears throat> excuse me, we can leverage identifiers and aggregators like the Digital Library of America. The Global Bioinformation Facility, GBIF, is using DOIs for creating data sets when information is downloaded. It allows us to then track our specimens and its usages. iDigBio is a, an advancing digitization of biodiversity collections and collects data and images of millions of biological specimens. The Biodiversity Heritage Library, what Bess mentioned earlier, is working on um, legacy literature and is registering DOIs for tracking citations. And I believe there's a presentation somewhere in, in Pitapalooza about that. Um, we also participate in the American Art Collective and are sharing more, inf more information in Wikidata. And I'd also like to quickly mention that Smithsonian is part of the open science, um, part of the U.S. Office of Science and Technology, and specifically uh, working on a group with persistent ide identifiers. I think there was a talk earlier today by someone. Though we're not exactly a federal agency, we participate because we have federal employees and we have some federal funding. As part of our core mission on the diffusion of knowledge, we feel very strongly about individuals producing federally funded research making sure it's identified, connected to federal grants as appropriate, products and research and like data and publications are well identified as well. So um, I should mention also that I have been adding other little images that are been on the slides. We have a, a, a medal um, that is from um, the African American History and Culture Museum. It's a distinguished service cross. Um, and uh, the brain, I decided to use the one of the title pages from the volume of the ENIAC manual that the Smithsonian Libraries has scanned. So if you all are really into real nerd stuff, we, we really have it. All right. So what's next for the Smithsonian and PIDs? Uh, with DOIs, this past year we assigned our first to an instrument. We chose to use DataCite because they have a physical object type. 
And so our Smithsonian Institution High Performance Computing Cluster now has a DOI. In this past year, 17 publications acknowledged our high, performing, high performance computing cluster in their research. Um, we will continue to reg register DOIs for instruments as needed. For ORCIDs, we will continue to encourage our staff and researchers to register for ORCIDs and make the Smithsonian a trusted organization. We also need to choose a unique identifier for deceased people. With ARCs, we need to decide how to handle ARCs that get retired, merged, or moved to different collections. We may implement redirects, a message noting that an ARC has been retired, or maybe an ARC tombstone for deaccessioned or destroyed materials. We also want to implement inflections. Inflections are characters appended to an ARC. Different characters will return different results, like metadata in a specified format, for example, JSON, or a brief metadata record. Um, we also have uh, applied for and gotten a, sorry, um, a um, ROAR ID from the research organization registration community, which we just heard from. Uh, and this actually was for a research facility, our Barrow, Colorado Island research facility. And so it, when we were granted the ROAR, they said it was a new and more granular level to their hierarchy, uh, since they're really designed for organizations. So it was interesting to hear your presentation before ours and um, wonder if you're going to be going more, doing more with facilities in the future. Uh, another option for us is to continue to use grid for facilities. So these are decisions that we'll have to make in the future. Which brings us to our second poll. What identifier do you use for research facilities, if you use any? Um, so we are interested in seeing what identifiers become dominant for research facilities and instruments over the next few years. And now back to Suzanne. Well, oh, there's my little Oni. Um, thank you so much for following us over the rainbow and following our little golden path. Um, we really appreciate your participation. We do have in our slides um, the ability to go to the unique identifiers for all the images that we did include in our presentation. So I want to thank everybody and we could go to the question and answers and look at the answers to our um, poll questions. All righty. Would you like to look at the questions and answers first or the poll questions first? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's just one question in the Q&A. So uh, since that is in front of me, let's take a look at that now. Uh, which digital asset management system slash collection management systems are you using? So I answered that in the chat and the answer is a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the central Smithsonian dams is open text and we have uh, TMS, the, the by gallery systems, which is for, I think, 14 of our art units and galleries. We use EMU for natural history and NMAI, which is the National Museum of American Indian. Um, we use MIMSY-XG for American history, IRIS RBG for gardens, archive space for archival units, with the exception of our main archive units, which is something called CMS, which is homegrown. Did I, oh, uh, libraries is Horizon. We have DSpace for our digital repository. And Circe Dynex hmm. for our catalog. Yes, it's ancient. <laughs> and we're using Vivo for our profiling system. So we had to get all those aligned and working the same way, which was also part of the, the Herculean effort that happened last year. That we did that all last year. So good grief. Oh, I don't know the system that 3D uses. Uh, it is nothing right now. They are developing something called PackRat, um, which is the code name for it. Um, but they are very close to releasing that, and that will be open source on GitHub. Um, if you look at the Smithsonian's DPO digitization program office, their GitHub, they actually have a lot of the documentation for that if you're interested. Alrighty, so the, both of the polls 
uh, for your presentation should be visible in the polls section right now, so any of you can take a look at the the responses. So it's the two bottom polls. Okay. So, um, people people tuning in can't see what we got, but we got for unique identifiers. People are using Roar um, the most. We have Grid and ISNI as things none is pretty high and we had one vote for other that they were going to put in the chat and that that's for facility wiki data yeah wiki data was what was discussed in the comments yeah and that wiki data is one of the ones that i mean we're collecting the wiki data identifier the queue numbers um and trying to figure out where to store that but since it is um a free range situation with wiki data we can't monitor the um, people who, who think we should be called Smithsonian Institute, which <laughs> apparently many people do. So, In including Wonder Woman. So, <laughs> yeah. We got credited in Wonder Woman as the Smithsonian Institute. Can make thing. you cringe. So, um, the orchid, um, someone has put in a uh, dead orchid, which is a dork, <laughs> which I think <laughs> is brilliant. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, we use, in the libraries, we're used to using the Library of Congress and then VIAF for identifiers for people who um, are living or have passed on. Um, but something needs to happen because the dead, the dead people are a problem. So people use, are saying ORCID, VIAF. Um, no one voted for researcher ID, but I believe I saw that in the comments. Um, and then someone did say that we're going to do some write-ins on those as well. Uh, John suggested snack for deceased people. Yeah, so um, this uh, for those who, I mean, maybe John, you could tell a little bit more about that, but it's uh, the archival people and it's, um, it is extremely interesting, but uh, we are not, I don't believe we are participating in snack at the moment. And they is. Are they? National Anthropological Archives, a little bit. A little bit. I think there's a few people who are a little bitting, but but the institution as a whole has not yet jumped on board. Okay, we have one more question in the that just showed up in the Q and A. Are you or any units within Smithsonian Institution using persistent identifiers with custom ontologies or controlled vocabularies? I'm not sure I understand the question. Custom yeah. ontologies? Yeah, custom ontologies or custom controlled vocabularies. I don't know, Jeff, if you want to uh, elaborate on that. Otherwise, um, we'll be copying and pasting uh, these questions into the Slack, um, the Slack Q&A channel so we can take it over there. So with all our different systems, um, the communication is a problem. And so we have started a centralized uh, system called EDAN, and I don't know what it stands for. It changes what it stands for. <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically our centralized Smithsonian <laughs> index. <laughs> Sorry, Suzanne, it makes a lot of noise when you move your headphones, just so you know. <laughs> um, we have a central Smithsonian index and suite of services that we call EDEN. Um, don't know what the current acronym stands for anymore, um, but that's what we use. We export our data in a common data model, and then that's how we use the identifiers to link and push everything together. I guess I could have done that earlier, sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, um, we will wrap it up and switch over to the next presenter. But thank you so much. And any other um, questions and answers, we'll take over to the Slack channel. Terrific. Thanks. I'm thank disappointed. You. I had my nerdy equation slides ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to send you back to the to the audience.